My name is Bob. It's good to have you here. Uh, I'm so glad that we get to be together. Uh, one more thing before we jump into the Lament series. Uh, many in our flying community know people who were lost in the military uh, this past week. And uh, just remember as a church and as a family, we need to not only be praying for our men and women who serve alongside and who are risking their lives in machines daily, uh, but those who have suffered loss and uh, we just need to be lifting them up in this time. So let me remind you to offer a word of encouragement and stop and to pray for those who have experienced that and who must go on. We're in a two-week series on lament, and last week, uh, I'm just going to give you a really, really quick introduction, bring you up to speed. Uh, we talked about what is a lament, why we lament, and then we had a look at David's lament in Psalm chapter 13. And this week, we're going to discover a little bit about learning to lament, and we're going to take some principles out. It's, uh, it's not my typical message, and I was struggling with this because typically I would take a passage and just exegete it, and I really want us to, to understand this discipline, to, to develop the skill of learning to lament and reading the laments and identifying with them and bringing things to God And so uh, follow along with us. I think it'll be a great morning, but here we go. Last week we talked about lament. We wanted to use common language, and I said it's a form of prayer. It's actually for the Christian. It's not just complaining, and it's not just whining, but it's a language for living between the poles of a hard life and a trust in God's sovereignty. We tend to swing into the ditches on either side, and there needs to be this raw and honest communication with God about what is This identification, this identifying with the frustration of the things that we face in this world, the pain that we encounter, the helplessness that we feel, it's this honest language about brokenness and about disappointment and about despair, and and it's identifying and going to God and, and really identifying our need for help. Not only do we identify how we feel and articulate that in ways that, uh, if you read some of them, are, are actually over the top. But we, we say we need your intervention. Uh, we don't see a way this is all going to just work out. And this is all just going to go by. We need your salvation. We need your justice when some things are happening. We need your forgiveness. We need something beyond ourselves. And so it's not only identifying what we're going through, identifying what we need and taking all that to God, but it's meant to do something. It's meant to restore confidence and trust in a living and almighty God. It's meant to provide the conditions in which we can come to God and we can surrender what it is we're going through and accept what it is he has to bring to us. It's this place of confidence, this place of trust, this place of surrender, this place of encountering the sovereignty of God and then discovering peace. Again, just a short quote that uh, came from Paul Miller in his book. I used the longer one last week, and I just cut it down. Here's what it says. We live in a deeply broken world. If the pieces of our world aren't breaking your heart, and you aren't in God's face about them, then you've thrown in the towel. Why is lament important? I went to John chapter 16, verse 33. And Jesus is in the upper room, and he's talking to the disciples, and, and, and he's, he says three things really clearly. He said, I've said these things to you, that in me, you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation, but take heart. I've overcome the world. You see, the biblical example is clear about lament, uh, from a third of the Psalms being laments to you know, Habakkuk to Jeremiah to the book of Lamentations to Job. You go through and you see the people just being raw and honest and crying out to God. You see Jesus in the garden just unto despair, pleading with the Father, can this cup be taken from me? And the scriptures are just clear from beginning to end that lament is part of the tools or one of the tools in the toolbox of the discipline of the Christian life. It's something that's important. We know that our human condition demands it, that our feelings will find a way out. 
that they'll find a way of expression and much of the art we identify with and much of the music that we, we so connect with and listen to express in artistic and lyrical ways um, the feelings that are so deep within us. And the human condition is such that if you deny your feelings, you're going to end up either self-medicating or falling into deep cynicism. And cynicism will move you away from God, not closer to God. And lament for the Christian is meant to push you into the presence of God and push you into the, the sustaining power of God and give you that place where peace is found in your heart. In this season of life, as we look at a world that looks different than it, it's looked before, as we look at trying to figure out what's going to reopen when, and how's these jobs going to come back, and, and is the price of oil going to recover, and can I move around, and what's going to happen here, and, and, and how's this all going to work out? We have this divine invitation to learn this skill to identify clearly our situation, what we're feeling, what we're encountering, where we need God, to clarify what we're asking him to do, where we're asking him to meet us, and to come to this place of declaring our surrender and dependence. Because the Almighty God knew the time and the place of where he would have you and what was going to happen. With that in mind, let's read one of the laments found in Psalm 142. David, a king, is on the run for his life, and he's in a cave. Uh, all the promises that he thought God had given him, in fact, God had given him, weren't coming to fruition in a way that he imagined. Listen as he cries out to God. With my voice, I cry out to the Lord. With my voice, I plead for mercy to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before him. I tell my trouble before him. When my spirit faints within me, you know my way. In the path where I walk, they have hidden a trap for me. Look to the right and see, there's none who takes notice of me. No refuge remains to me. No one cares for my soul. I cry to you, O Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Attend to my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are too strong for me. Bring me out of prison that I might give thanks to your name. The righteous will surround me, for you will deal bountifully with me. What I want to do is I've poured through a bunch of laments and a bunch of the Psalms, and I've come up with some overriding uh, principles or uh, some things that, that they're built around that I want to offer to you to use in both reading them and identifying with them and then in practicing the process of lament in your life. First, all of them take and express my situation. There's this divine invitation to honestly pour out where you're at. Now, here's some things I've identified in various Psalms. Uh, he starts with, I'm overwhelmed by my circumstances. <laughs> Ever been there? Ever checked the bank account and uh, realized that what needs to come out and what's in isn't there? Or the cupboard, uh, the food that you're requiring isn't. Ever been overwhelmed by your circumstances? You, you just don't know how you can go on, how facing everything that you're facing, it's going to work out. If you look into the laments, what you see is this desperation. There's no way out that I see. You see them expressing this disappointment. This is not what I expected. This is not what I was counting on. And you, you definitely feel this abandonment. Over and over, they sort of cry out, where are you, God? Another reason for lament or pattern that we see in lament is a brokenness by our sin. If you go to Psalm 38, David is reflecting on that time when he was uh, a murderer and an adulterer, and he was hiding his sin. And it pours out, what happens when God pulls the curtain back and shows you, and I don't know if you've ever been in that place, but there's this shame and this sorrow. 
this, look, this seeing your actions and seeing how you've disappointed people and God in your life. There's this failure and feeling that I am deserving of. And there's this feeling that I've been responsible for. And so not only would they be overwhelmed by their circumstances, but there's many laments where you're just broken by where you find yourself. And you realize that it's been your sin that's got you there. Another reason we find in Psalm 88 would be helplessness in my sickness, where they're experiencing pain, both physical and emotional. They're living in a world that's broken. This is not what I was meant to experience. And they're going through great loss. And I don't know, maybe this is a time in your life where the pain or the loss or the things you're feeling emotionally or even what you're facing physically needs to drive you to pour those feelings out to the living and the Almighty God. Another reason we find for lament in Psalm 32 would be the condition of my soul. The recognition, like Paul says in Romans 7, that what I want to do, I find myself not doing, and what I don't want to do, I find myself doing. And lament is one of those tools to deal with rebelliousness. It's the antidote for hopelessness. It's that coming to the place of saying, I don't know without you if I have what it takes to go on like this. And to allow God to meet you in that, to say you must or surely I am lost. It's the identification of our circumstances and the expression of them in all of these different forms. And then you find in all of these laments, the identification of my need, this articulation, here's what I'm asking for. You ever have that experience where you have this person in your life and they want something from you, but they're not direct? And, and you, you might be short on time or you might be, you know, it might be in a work situation and they come to you and they're like, hey, how you doing, buddy? They're talking to you. And finally, you just want to go, what do you want? What can I do for you? Ever been there? My staff's all putting their hand up. Yeah, I'm like that with you all the time. In a sense, learning the skill of lament is not only identifying with your feelings and identifying with why you feel like that, but it's articulating to God what you'd like him to do. I wonder, just me, just a Bob thought, when he says you have not because you ask not, maybe some of the ways we need God to show up in our lives and things we need him to touch, he hasn't yet because we haven't articulated what it is to him. But here's what we find in these laments. It starts with this, over and over and over. I think in all of them, I need your presence. I've been missing hanging out with my son, missing being able to go to my parents, and when we talk, I say, man, I can't wait till we're together. I can't wait to see you. And in many of the laments, what you see is this need of his presence. And here's the kind of terminology that's used. I need you to hear me. I need you to turn to me. I'm waiting on you. It's you alone. How long? Where have you been? I need your presence. Secondly, they're articulating a need over and over and over for protection. Now we have an enemy that's seeking to devour, that wants to destroy. The Bible says he, he's just constantly on the look. And you see over and over this lament, this cry out for not only your presence, but your protection against enemies, your protection against being overcome, so distressed in soul, so distant from your creator that you're just willing to give up, that you're looking for any way to ease your own pain. This protection against losing hope. And then you find, I need your provision. It's interesting that over and over, they talk about everything from the forgiveness of sin to the salvation in their situation to the rescue from the very imminent problems that they face. And then they say, we need your provision in meeting out justice, in solving some of the problems with our world, in dealing with the evil people, in setting right things that are not right. And in a lament, you see this great heart pouring out, going, we need your provision, we need you to act, we need you to do something. 
Not only do we need your presence and we need to know you care, not only do we need your protection that you will hang on to us, we need your provision to set things right. And finally, all of the laments proclaim this, we need your peace. Somehow at the end of this, there needs to be this restoration in a relationship between you and I. There needs to be this place that we come to. Give me a touch from your hand. Show up. I need to feel. I need to somehow come to a surrender, a peace between where I am and who you are. All the laments start with, this is my situation. And as you read them and you write them, it's a great place for you to start identifying your feelings. It comes to an identification of what you need and, and what you're asking for and an articulation of where you're at. And then it comes to this. I'm going to declare reasons I can trust you. Reasons I find in the different laments to declare your trust in God. Over and over, the psalmist and others go to the character of God that he has revealed. He says, you are steadfast, you are just, you are loving, you are merciful, you are able. This is who you've revealed yourself to be. And so there's this declarative thing that happens where once they've identified how they feel and articulated what they need and they've cried out to God, they begin to declare, this is your character, this is what you do. Then they come to the promises of God and they begin to claim them. God, this is what you have promised. You've promised you'd never leave me or forsake me. I'm waiting on you. You've promised that you would uphold the righteous. You've promised that your yoke would be easy, your burden would be light. They move from the character of God revealed and the promise of God claimed to the experience of God recalled. They go back and say, you have been faithful and I recall the moments of intimacy and I recall the moments of provision and I go back and I declare, I know our relationship and who you are. And then in every lament, there's this thing that's quite interesting. They want the glory of God to be important. My friend Darren has this phrase he uses all the time where he says, uh, let's just be people who see Jesus lifted high no matter what we're doing. And I love that image. And uh, if you ever want to do a really fun study, study the glory of God and its, uh, its related components in Scripture. It's very interesting that God demands to be glorified and he deserves to be glorified, and he expects his people to glorify him. And it seems that in many of the laments, one of the things they say is, um, we want your name to be glorified in this. Your name and your glory matters. And if you want to read one, uh, look at Psalm 84 as he talks about that. So with all this in mind, with kind of some of an outline of what we find, let's read Psalm 6 together. With fresh eyes. O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. Heal me. O Lord, for my bones are troubled. My soul also is greatly troubled. But you, O Lord, how long? Turn, O Lord, deliver my life. Save me for the sake of your steadfast love. For in death there's no remembrance of you. In Sheol, who will give you praise? I am weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with my weeping. My eye wastes away because of grief. It grows weak because of all my foes. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. For the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. 
The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies shall be ashamed and greatly troubled. They shall turn back and be put to shame in a moment. Well, let's ask the big question. So what? what? I love these guys. I really want us to recover in this season and as a spiritual tool in our toolbox, the practice of lament. I want you to understand what it is. I want you to know why it's important. I want you to read the laments of Scripture with an identification and new eyes. I don't want you to be scared of going to God with hyperbole and exaggeration in a sense saying, all is lost and pouring it out with the greatest of emotion. Because it's what the Bible exhibits. And it's what he asks us to do. And it's a way that he created us. And it's what we need to come to that place of surrender and of peace. And of God doing this divine work in our life we can't do in our own. Three ways I want to suggest that we begin to write and practice laments. First, around here we have something called 3D Discipleship. And the third D is that the heart of God would be duplicated in yours. It's discover Jesus from beginning to all the time. It's demonstrate his life in your practices and in who you are and in in all that you're learning. And then it's duplicate his heart in yours. When the heart of God is duplicated in ours, we look at our world and we start to see things. And in the big sense, let's just talk in the big way, we need to begin to lament for our world, for the injustice that mankind is evil to mankind, that human beings are being bought and sold, that people are starving in a a world where there's enough food, that people are being mistreated, that they're, they're being oppressed, that our brothers and sisters are being persecuted. We need to be heartbroken for the spiritual condition of our land and our world and people around us who are claiming truth as foolish, like claiming foolishness as truth, not claiming that God's way is the right way, knowing that they will stand before a living and almighty God and happily pay the penalty for their sin. They don't understand the horror of that. They don't understand what's coming. We do, and we've been, God said, take this to them. We should be heartbroken, and one of the ways of lament that we should learn is to begin to express our feeling, our frustration, our sorrow, and ask God to act, to show himself, to bring people. If you want to see examples of that, look at Ecclesiastes 4, 1 to 3, Habakkuk 1, 1 to 4. The second way I would encourage us to practice lament is corporate. You know, the Bible says this about the community of faith in Romans 12, 15, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. I am so glad I, get, I got to officiate at a wedding yesterday, and uh, it was so fun to watch people get married and to celebrate, and your heart is full for them, and you, you got to be a part of a great thing. And as, alongside that, I get to walk with people who are going through incredible loss, and your heart is broken for them, and, and you lift one another to Jesus. As we look at our community, we should be writing psalms of lament prayers of lament where we orient ourselves back to God's provision. I mean, how about all the graduations we're going to miss? Our pilots miss their big grad and the family coming. Grade 12s are going through. Just what they're feeling is this sense of incompleteness. This sense, I worked this hard to get here and it's not happening. The person in the oil field that created the business, that's poured their lives into the community, and that through no fault of their own finds themselves with the doors closed wondering what's going to happen. To feel their pain, to bring that to God and say, God, we don't get it, and this doesn't seem right, and it doesn't seem fair, and ask for God to show up in the situation, and then to begin to reorient ourselves around the character of God, the promises of God how God has worked in the past, we can give testimony to, and then looking that God will get the glory. There's this point in that of surrender, and there's this point of that 
in that of participation in our community. And, and I just invoke you to begin to ask God to show you the world and to begin to feel that and to pour it back in prayer to him. To ask God to show you in our community, in our community of faith, and those that he allows you to journey with. And identify with them and in lament, bring that to Jesus and let him touch it. And the final way, obviously, is a lament that is personal. I love this divine invitation to be so real about how we feel and what we're going through, to be artistic about putting it together, to take time with ability to process what we need, what are we asking for, and then to come to this place of surrender and receiving of peace. Now you might say, Bob, that, that, uh, that doesn't work. And I'm here to tell you it does. And one of our congregation, in fact, one of our tech team, has agreed to share a lament that he's read. Good morning, brothers and sisters. My name is Johan, and this is my lament. God, I know that you are king over all, that you created all things, and that your breath sustains all things. I know that your ways and your thoughts are infinitely greater than mine. Your wisdom, your righteousness, your holiness have no equal in heaven and earth. You have blessed me richly in all things. Your love and your compassion for me have no limits. I know all this and still I reject your will and live by my own. I take control thinking I know better than the former generation. That I can and am doing better. In prideful arrogance, I am blind to the pain I cause to those I love the most. Relationships destroyed that I am powerless to fix. Despite my best efforts, I fail to find words that heal. I cannot bridge the gaps that I have created. I have reached the limits of my wisdom. I don't have the strength to carry the guilt and shame anymore. But in the deepest depths of my despair, I hear your voice. When my will is broken and I cry out to you, I feel you lift the weight off of my heart. When I am no longer able to sustain myself, you meet me with grace and mercy. With you, all things are possible. You alone are able to redeem my worst mistakes. Your words have the power to heal. By the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ, I am your adopted son. Father, fill me with your Holy Spirit and enable me to submit to your will. Heal the rifts that, rifts that I have created and let me lean on your strength and wisdom continually. Amen. I get to give you a benediction. Please hang around and uh, reflect with the, the song that will be played. But as, as we close our service, let me give you a benediction. May the Almighty God bless you and would he keep you. Would he make his face to shine upon you and pour out his grace, his unmerited favor in your life? Oh, would he turn his countenance toward you as you turn to him in lament, in rejoicing, in praise, in need, and grant to you everything that you need to discover peace, the peace that passes the understanding of mankind and all God's people said. Amen. Mm -hmm.